Hello world, Dan Brown here uh, with the very first ever episode of EDH Rec Tech, a Magic the Gathering deck building show about the uh, variant known as Elder Dragon Highlander, where we use the popular online deck building tool EDH Rec um, to analyze the signature cards of given commanders to figure out what the masses are doing well and where the masses uh, might be leading the rest of the masses astray in their uh, pursuit to figure out good cards to put in their decks with given commanders. Uh, the way it's going to work is, yeah, we look at the signature cards, I give you my opinions as to which ones are good and which ones are bad, and then uh, we do a little deck tech about a deck that I have built that I think is good. Uh, a few caveats here before we begin. Um, I, I, I am making these with kind of the average, right? The median EDH player in mind. That is to say, people who have a budget but aren't trying to play like super budget. Like, no cards in my deck techs will cost more than $15, at least at the time of recording this. Card prices do fluctuate, blah, blah, blah. Um, and also, um, the decks that I'm building are not combo decks, by and large. <laughs> I guess a few of them maybe if you squint real hard. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, they, they are trying to win with damage. Um, they are trying to win with, you know, by going to combat, playing uh, a punchy game of commander uh, without breaking too many backs too quickly in ways that are unfun, right? Uh, so this week, uh, the long-anticipated Pogoback Gaming video about Ramos... 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 Ramos Dragon Engine! Legendary artifact creature dragon for six mana. Uh, has flying, it's 4-4, four, four, and the real meat is whenever you cast a spell, you put a plus one, plus one counter on Ramos for each of that spell's colors, and then you can remove five of those counters to add Wooberg Wooberg. That is ten mana, two of each color, to your mana pool. You can only do that once per turn, but it doesn't say your turn, right? You can do this on opponent's turns, which means that potentially, in like a four-player game, that's like 40 mana per turn cycle, which is pretty bonkers. And, you know, also worthy to, uh, or worth spelling out that uh, you can spend, the, the mana that you spend from Ramos's gush ability, as I'll be calling it, uh, then can feed right back into putting counters on Ramos, right? There's nothing preventing that mana from putting counters on Ramos, so it's not that far-fetched that you would be able to fire this off multiple times per turn cycle. So, anyway, signature cards for Ramos. There they are. This is just a snapshot in time. Once again, I'm filming all 12 of the EDH Rec Tech episodes of this season at the same time. So um, new sets will have come out even by the time you're watching this. These signature cards might not be exactly the same, but, you know, it'll give us an idea. It, it will still be informational, edutainmentable for everybody. Abzan Charm is a super good card. <laughs> uh, uh, the first two modes are probably the most relevant the most often, exiling a scary creature or uh, just drawing two cards and losing two life at instant speed. It's just like a slightly better divination in most cases. 40 life, we normally don't care about losing two of them. Uh, and even the last ability can be pretty relevant in Ramos because coupled with the three colors that Abzan Charm is, uh, it immediately allows you to gush Ramos into Wooberg Wooberg. Um, if that was the only thing Abzan Charm did, um, probably would not be worthy of a deck slot because I don't typically like ritual effects in Commander unless you're running tons of card draw to replace them uh, because ritual effects are card disadvantage, right? You're just throwing away a card for nothing but mana, which okay, obviously you can do scary things with the mana in certain situations, but usually card draw, ramp, or control, or like win conditions of other sorts would be better. Um, Abs and Charm's real good, though. Door to Nothingness! I... <laughs> I, ah, I don't love, I don't like Door to Nothingness very much. Uh, if you are a crazy combo Johnny who's just hell-bent on building like a bottom-up deck around Door to Nothingness, like with that as your win condition, then I suppose Ramos is probably your best, yeah, it's, it's a good option for a commander. I don't know who your best option is. Uh, I don't know how to help you really. Because <laughs> it's just, I mean, you have to dedicate a lot of deck slots a lot of support cards to make this go off in a way that makes sense. To have five mana to cast it, a way to untap it, and then ten mana available to immediately get value from it. Because if this just sits around, either it's going to be dealt with or you're going to be dealt with. And that's uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's smart. And, and even best case scenario, let's let's say that you dedicate the deck slots and you get a deck that's humming pretty well with this and it works. Okay, where does that leave you with your friends? Right? If someone if someone just loses the game, 
at the drop of a hat with no real regard for what's gone on in the game before. I mean, I guess letting you set up a board that you know enables you to do this is you know, relevant to what's gone on before in the game, but like, I, you might be drinking some salty tears for dinner is all I'm saying. And I don't know. I don't know if that's what you want to do. I, I would. I would advise you to maybe reconsider. But I'll. I'll move on. I'll move on. I know that weird Johnny combos are important to some people, so I don't want to make you feel too bad. But I don't like door to nothingness. Conflux, on the other hand, the only word of caution I have here is that people tend to overcommit deck slots to big bomby spells that synergize with their commanders. Um, but that being said, of, of all the big bomby spells that synergize with Commander Conflux and Ramos, sure seems to make a heck of a lot of sense. If you can hard cast the Conflux, then you will immediately get the five counters, which will enable you to make ten mana to play the spells you search your library for, which should be enough to all but win the game for you in many, many situations. So that seems good. Don't run too many bomb spells, but of the ten or so that you run, Conflux would be not, not a bad choice. Jund Charm, I feel like this is uh, uh, usually not worth a spot in a Ramos deck. Uh, if you are in a graveyard heavy meta, then the first mode is obviously relevant. If you're in a token heavy meta, then the second mode is obviously relevant. But those are, I don't want to say corner cases, like they will be in a statistically significant number of pods, but... Um, when you're analyzing a card, when you're questioning if you should put a card in your deck, you always want to think about what the worst case scenario is, and that would be, I don't know, a control-heavy pod. Um, not, a, not a ton that this does for you, other than its last ability, which, just like Abzan Charm, can immediately enable Ramos to make 10 mana. But I don't love ritual effects in Commander, and, uh, you know, ritual effects that are contingent on your commander being in play and not having been dealt with. Uh, and, and keep in mind, opponents can respond to the trigger on Ramos by killing him. Just, uh, it seems weaker than some of the cards here on the signature cards. I, I don't know that I can recommend running this in most Ramos builds. Adana's Climb, transforming into Winged Temple of Verazka or whatever. Uh, very unique card design. Uh, gotta give props to Wizards for that. Uh, and it's also it's also super good. Like it's hard to put this in a specific category. I guess I'd consider this a ramp effect because especially in Ramos, if Ramos is in play, you'll get the two counters for the colors on Hadana's climb, and then the third counter when you enter combat, assuming you play it first main phase, uh, which would immediately transform it into a land, which makes it a ramp effect, right? And the ability on that land. I mean, flying is redundant, but that doesn't matter because doubling Ramos's power will enable you to knock out a player in one shot pretty easily. Uh, yeah, really no way to analyze this within Ramos and conclude that it's anything but a good include. I, I like it a lot. Villainous Wealth, on the other hand, uh, I, I have tried. Like, it, it's, it feels like a, the sort of card that if you pour 15 mana into it, it'll just win you the game. But it's, uh, I don't think that's always the case. Like, that, that is only the case, maybe I should say. If you are playing in a pod where one of your opponents um, is running a deck that is super committed to building a really permanent heavy board. Because if you're playing in a more control heavy pod, like yes, you can cast their control effects, but you know, not being able to choose when you fire off control effects makes them a lot worse. Um, you know, if you're trying to bounce a creature to its owner's hand, it's best to wait until that creature is swinging at you, right? Or if that, <laughs> wait until that creature's on the board, even. Uh, so, like, there have just been too many times where I do pour, like, 15 mana into this just to, like, do a couple control effects that aren't the control effects I would have chosen in a vacuum and maybe get, like, a land or two and maybe, like, a mid-range creature or two, but, like, not... Not 15 mana's worth of payoff. Uh, I, I just don't like it. It's just not... I mean, unless your playgroup is super board-building heavy, I don't think I can recommend Villainous Wealth in Ramos. Um, and the same goes for Corpse Jack Menace here. Uh, first of all, any 
effect with legs. That is to say, any effect that's stapled to a creature is pretty vulnerable. Um, it'll just get caught as collateral damage in a board wipe, or is easy to deal with if people choose to deal with it. Um, I, I just don't know that it's that big of an effect, though. Like, people often fall into the trap when building commander decks of seeing a card that does something similar to what their commander does and thinking that that makes it, like, better in that commander's 99, when in fact... It's just like redundancy and actually makes it a little bit worse. I don't think Ramos has much of an issue getting lots and lots of counters and being able to gush 10 mana. I don't think he really needs the support of Corpse Jack Menace. And unless you have ways to potentially bring Corpse Jack back from the graveyard when he inevitably dies, um, I, I just don't think it's really that good. I don't think it's that necessary. I think he'd be better suited dedicating the slot to ramp card draw control or miscellaneous other Proge <laughs> progenitus oh, there it is wow a uh, big scary creature very cool to have a card that says protection from everything on it and you know i don't think this is quite as good as conflux although it's a good thing to fetch up with conflux and then immediately play off of your ramos mana so like yes yeah, same basic words of wisdom i give with conflux is you don't want too many of these end game effects but progenitus is a perfectly viable option uh and this is a good deck to run your copy of it if it's it's burning a hole in your pocket so yeah I, yeah i yeah i like it i like it and sultai charm nothing not to like i think this should be like the second signature card uh right after abzan charm destroy target monocolored creature almost always relevant maybe slightly less good in commander than other constructed formats just because um commanders tend to be multicolored but you know if, if it's first ability it doesn't work for you destroying an artifact or an enchantment is really good utility the board will thank you for being the one person to have an answer to whatever problem enchantment is sitting around um, and if nothing else its last ability is better than cycling and adds three counters to ramos to boot uh, very good very good option sultai charm should probably go in almost every ramos deck um, esper charm is still still very good. I think its most relevant ability is probably its second one, just divination at instant speed, drawing two cards, um, followed by destroying target enchantment. That is uh, often good, and when it's good, again, the board, the rest of your fellow planeswalkers will thank you for dealing with the one problem opponent's problem enchantment that they don't have an answer to because they haven't seen EDH Rec Tech. I don't know if I can take credit for that, actually. I might walk that statement back. I don't know that I advise running that much enchantment removal, to be honest. So maybe I'm just projecting. Maybe I am the player that's thankful that you are running Esper Charm in the pod to deal with player C that is neither of us. I digress. Discarding two cards, not that relevant usually. Although there might be some corner cases where you really need to hamstring a problem opponent. Uh, Esper Charm, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, uh, it's on the bubble. Like, you might you might cut it for better removal, but uh, well, yeah, why, yeah, yeah, yeah. And finally, we have Sunbird's Invocation. Uh, this falls into the same category as like Conflux or like Progenitus. It is a potentially back-breaking late game, maybe mid-game at six mana, uh, effect that can like totally win, but not by itself. It is contingent on having like other cards in hand um, to play. But w w when you get it going, yeah, absolutely can be ridiculously good. And you get Ramos counters for, you know, one for casting sunbirds then whatever for the cast from hand and then whatever once again from whatever you get once you go digging um so like in in a more wombo storm build of ramos like less control more wombo storm then yeah i think this is a, a good include um the particular ramos build that i have put together is more in the control direction so i'm not running this um but yeah i i, I can definitely see this being super super good so those are the signature cards of Ramos, at least at the time that I am <laughs> making this video. Um, let's get into the deck tech here, shall we? Deck tech, EDH rec tech deck tech for Ramos's Dargan Eggnog. That's the name of the deck. It's a good stuff control deck and our primary win condition is Ramos. We're gonna have him swing in for commander damage. It's just, it's just right there. Like, it's just obvious. Like, that's the way you should try to win with Ramos at the helm. Saves you a lot of deck slots. Y you can save a lot of, like, big fat flyers or whatever else you'd be trying to use to win by just swinging in with your commander. And virtually every spell in the deck is at least one color, but word to the wise, you don't want to force multicolor over better monocolored spells. Um, and also, w worth considering that 
interaction spells or any spell really i guess that costs one mana of any of a color like one mana of a color just not a colorless spell which i guess that's kind of rare anyway uh is just as efficient as one of these three color charms right one mana for one counter on ramos versus three mana for three counters on ramos you know it's the same it's the same ratio uh as long as you run enough card draw to you know replace those effects then uh you know no, no reason not to run pongify rapid hybridization swords path to exile or at least like consider them um and and just the last bullet point here again despite ramos ability to make 10 mana you, you don't want to get too carried away with that you don't want to be distracted by that language printed on the commander like you you want five maybe 10 maybe 15 back-breaking end game type spells but you, you you don't want 30 okay that's not going to get you very far into the pod you're just going to sit with them in your hand all game and be upset when they remove ramos um so the deck that I've put together, uh, Ramos's Dargan Eggnog, has an average amount of ramp effects at 15. None of them are artifacts, except for Soul Ring, because Soul Ring is just it's the best card ever printed, in my opinion. And even in Ramos, who loves spells that you know have, have are, are colored spells, uh, he even Ramos is okay with Soul Ring. Okay, but the rest of the ramp effects are green. They're they're in green for the most part so that we can get at least one counter every time we cast Cultivate or Kodama's Reach. Um, as for draw, just kind of an average amount of draw. 13, enough to uh, grease the gears, keep our hand full most of the time. And then, uh, yeah, the bread and butter, the, the thing that really makes the deck hum is the control suite we have here. We have a great amount of control. That's why it's hot pink at 22. And having access to all five colors means that we have some spicy, spicy control options. We can deal with, you know, individual threats like there's no tomorrow, as good as any deck at that. Uh, so the game plan is to ramp, draw, and control threats. Maybe I should put even more emphasis on controlling threats. That's really, that's what we're doing. And then we're going to pressure opponents with commander damage. Not too hard to get Ramos up to 7 power, maybe 11 power. Kill people in 3 swings, 2 swings, maybe 1 swing. Uh, and then we will break backs with Ramos-powered payoff spells. That's the game plan before we get into the deck. If you want to put a little bit of bread in my pocket while putting a little bit of cards in your trade binder, head on over to FlipSideGaming.com. I have partnered up with them. Um, I've got a promo code POGO. Next time you want to pick up a batch of magic cards, why not try to do it from them? Why not use my promo code? Why not help me? Why not, why not help incentivize me to make more of this content that you, you love and crave oh so much? Uh, that's how you can do it. Also, uh, doing a series about EDH rec and starting with like a commander's individual page as a starting point really, really lends itself to kind of top down good stuff deck design over the course of the next 12 weeks. There might be a couple occasions where you find yourself thinking like, man, all these decks, they're, they're kind of similar. Like, there, there are certainly some differences. Like I'm not trying to scare you away from watching every single one of them because you're going to learn from every single episode. But, 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 I want to get ahead of the criticism that they're all the same and they're all top down. So. I want to crowdsource bottom-up deck building ideas. Let me explain what I mean by that. I mean like two cards that interact in a really kind of unique synergistic way that like just really inspires you uh, or that you think would be cool but you don't have like the resources or the cards to like build the deck right now. Or you maybe you have, maybe you do and you want to see what my take on it would be. Send me cool card synergies without like telling me a specific commander and I'll use those as a starting point for the next batch of EDH content that I make probably uh, in quarter four of this year towards the end of 2018. My email address is danbrownuniverse at gmail.com. Send those my way. Be greatly appreciated. All right, uh, let's let's get to the deck. So here we have the mana base uh, for Ramos, Darg, and Eggnog. Uh, first up, they're just listed in alphabetical order here. Um, Arcane Sanctum. Uh, we actually run a full cycle of these three color tap lands. Normally, uh, I don't love running lands that automatically enter the battlefield tapped, but in a five color deck on a you know pseudo budget, no card costs more than fifteen dollars. Uh, they're just a good option to really, really help with fixing. I think that you will find, once you get to a mid-game, more often than not, these basically function as five-color lands because you can, you know, because they make your mana from your lands that much more flexible just by being out there. So, you know, they're, they're very good. Um, next, Brushland. Um, I run 
many of the pain lands, sort of an assortment of lands that tap for two colors and either do enter untapped or can enter untapped, um, with a heavy emphasis on green, uh, just because we run so many uh, green ramp spells, because again, we want our ramp spells to have at least one color so that we can at least get some value with Ramos off of them. Uh, so it just makes sense. And that's just also a, a pretty common way to make a five color mana base work on a budget. That is to have it heavily based in green and then running a lot of green ramp spells, because those ramp spells usually uh, are also fixing. They help you hit colors that you might not have naturally drawn into. So Anyway, uh, there are going to be a few more pain lands, just an, an, an assortment of two-color lands that can enter untapped. Um, City of Brass, any deck that is four or five colors, I feel like this is close to an auto-include. Um, your life is a resource, and decks that tap into that resource at least a little bit tend to be at least a little bit better. Um, Command Tower goes in any deck that has two or more colors. Um, there's another three-color tap land, uh, Exotic Orchard. Yeah, pretty much any deck that's three or more colors, I'd say, should run this. Um, just really helps you get there. Forbidden Orchard, I like a lot. Uh, it does create a creature for your opponents, but being able to choose which opponent gets it helps you avoid any player that might be able to, you know, get disproportionate value off of a 1-1 one, one colorless spirit. Uh, also worthy of note, the spirit does not fly. Many spirits in magic fly. This spirit does not fly. <laughs> uh, basic lands, again, we are mostly in green. So what's that? Five forests versus, I think, one each of every other basic. And then we also have a suite of snow-covered basics. I'll get to those in just a second. Uh, Frontier Bivouac, another three-color tap land. Hinterland Harbor can enter untapped. And usually, if you draw it mid-game, late-game, it's almost always going to enter untapped. Uh, and that's when it, you know, well... I'm not going to say that entering... Yeah, actually, I guess it matters the most in the early game, whether a land enters tapped or untapped. Uh, there's our island, jungle shrine, another three-color tap land. Here's a pain land. Again, in green, pain land in green. Mana confluence, same thing as city of brass, effectively. Um, if you're in four or five colors, probably worth tapping into your life total as a resource. Mountain, mystic monastery, another tap land, tap land, tap land. Uh, there's a plains, root band crag. A lot of people have these lands these days because it's in standard, uh, and so when it rotates out of standard, its price is going to fall quite a bit. Uh, there are a whole lot of these in circulation now, so I like including them. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Uh, so here are our snow-covered basics. These are in here just because there is one two-mana ramp spell. And that's what we want to, like, our, you're going to see the sorceries that we have that ramp us. We love it when they are at two mana. Um, one of them only lets you search for a snow-covered basic. And so, you know, these are less than 15 bucks. I think usually they're less than three bucks. Uh, so we just have one of each. It helps us with fixing. It allows us to run one more good ramp spell. Uh, Sun Petal Grove, uh, Swamp, Vivid Grove. This one's a little bit different. It's the only Vivid I saw fit to include. I don't really know. I think that I probably just had one more deck slot left, and I was like, yeah, land that could tap for five, but is also green. Yeah, don't love that it enters tapped, but, um, you know, other than the triple tap lands, I'm not running too many others. And uh, so, yeah, you could maybe swap this out with something else out of your collection, but uh, yeah, good enough. At a certain point, it just doesn't really matter. And so another uh, check land and then another pain land, and that's the mana base. Here we have our ramp effects. Um, as you can see, we have 15. I guess I included a sideboard on this with Ramos. Why not? Uh, first up, Soul Ring. This is one of very, very few, maybe the only, maybe one of two, I forget, um, spells in the deck that have no color. It's just a colorless spell. That's because Soul Ring is the best card ever printed. Uh, <laughs> it's just even in Ramos, we don't mind. Uh, then we got Birds of Paradise, um, just a one mana way to ramp that also fixes our mana. Kiora's Follower is two colors and untaps any of our lands, which often functions as being um, a five color uh, dork. Sakura Tribelder helps us fix. We can fetch up whatever basic we don't currently have. Sylvan Carry added. Um, yeah, Hexproof fixes our mana. A little bit of blocker, a little bit of utility out of it. It just costs two mana. Uh, two mana ramp spells are fantastic. Um, we have Weirding Wood here. 
I like this. It synergizes with Kiora's Follower, if we ever get both of them. Uh, Kiora's Follower untapping a land that taps for two is like twice as much ramp. Uh, same thing with Fertile Ground, which uh, I'll show you in just a second. Um, and just the fact that it replaces itself over the course of EDH Rec Tech, you're going to hear me uh, harp and harp and harp away at how valuable drawing cards is. All of EDH is basically just who can play magic the longest, uh, and drawing cards is how you do that. So any card that replaces itself on top of doing other things that are just you know fundamentals of a good deck, that is ramp, card draw, and control, uh, is a really good card. Weirding Wood, love it. Um, Mana Bloom, this card, uh, I like it in Ramos particularly because we can cast it multiple times and get just multiple counters on Ramos because I kind of grind out some value. But I also like it for an opening hand. Dropping one of these for two, just with one charge counter, uh, you know, is not as good as like a far seek, I guess. Uh, but I guess adding extra value through Ramos can be better than that over time. Uh, and also, it's just like another two mana way to ramp in the early game. I just, uh, I wouldn't overlook Mana Bloom. I actually like Mana Bloom. It's uh, better than it might appear at first blush. Um, and then Fertile Ground, I was just talking about this. Another way to synergize with Kiora's Follower. Um, and just a two mana ramp spell in its own right. Uh, very good. Um, Cultivate, you know, a staple. If we're running a green ramp suite, this and Kadama's Reach go in any deck um, that is running green ramp as its primary source of ramp. I like deep, deep Recon here because it ramps and then it ramps again. Uh, so that's <laughs> twice as good. Eventually, we don't really care how much our spells cost. We just care what sort of value we're getting in exchange for them because in an EDH late game, you have often arbitrary amounts of mana, especially in Ramos. Um, Farseek, two mana ramp spell, just good. Into the North. This is what I was talking about when I was uh, showing you my snow-covered basics. This is why we run snow-covered basics. It's the only card in the deck that does anything with snow-covered basics. But there's no reason not to run this because it's a two-mana ramp spell. If you can also get a hold of, you know, ev even one of each of three of the snow-covered basics. And it's probably still worth running this. Um, if you only have one snow-covered basic the chances of you drawing into this and it in the same uh, game and same hand uh, are statistically significant, and then that turns us into a dead card, so you wouldn't want to do that. But uh, otherwise, yeah, Into the North, great card. Pick it up. Uh, Kadama's Reach, very good. Rampant Growth, two-mana ramp spell, and uh, Search for Tomorrow. I like this just because we can play at turn one for its suspend cost, and you know EDH is going to last. You know we're not playing against we're not playing a standard game against a, a really good mono red aggro deck, so I'm not worried about like this just not doing enough in time. Like in EDH, we're going to live to see turn six, seven. You know, so if we can play this turn one, that's good. Or at three mana, it's actually the same kind of net effect on the turn in terms of mana because the basic that you search up does not enter tapped. Worthy of clarifying that. Uh, yeah, so this really doesn't lose you any more mana on the turn than a far seek would. Uh, so that's very good. Our first draw effect of the 13 we have uh, is Sphinx's Revelation, one of two instants. Uh, first of all, it's in two colors, which is a perk with Ramos, but its ability is the real meat. You gain X life, draw X cards. If you're pouring 10 mana, that's seven. If you have more mana than that, which you very well might, uh, it's even more, it's just very good. That's the sort of um, game-winning play that this deck has when uh, you cast that on an opponent's end step right before your untap step. Very, very great, because you'll almost certainly be able to cast enough spells that you have drawn into to get Ramos to go off again. And uh, if Ramos then can swing, I don't know. There, there are some ways that that can laser cannon an opponent or uh, just win the game outright. Stroke of Genius, uh, same idea. You don't gain the life uh, and you don't get the same number of counters. It's only a one color spell, but still very good to, to, pour, to pour 10 mana into an X draw spell. Um, sorceries, uh, Ambitions Cost. I just like this card a lot. Um, it's an uncommon, it's been printed uh, in the commander set, so there, you know, its price is not going to skyrocket. Uh, draws you three cards, you lose three life, uh, but for four mana, you know, in a late game, even mid game, more important than the mana cost for what you're getting is just the number of cards you're getting for the number of cards you're giving, right? So if you are playing one card, ambitions cost, getting three cards back is pretty good. And losing three life, not that big a deal. Paying four mana, 
eh, you know, not that big of a deal. Um, so I, I like this card a lot. I think this card fits really well into many decks that are in black. Um, Council of the Soratami is uh, just a functional reprint of Divination right here. Uh, and I like these cards in general. They're like bubble cards for a lot, a lot of decks. Like if I was going through someone's deck and they were asking me for advice, I would almost never tell them that they should cut these cards because they are card advantage uh, and you don't have to sacrifice too much tempo for that three mana is not a ton um, and Ramos more than most decks I think incentivizes a little bit of a spell slinger feel you know if you're doing true spell slinger you'd probably want like one or two mana draw spells that are more like you know scry two draw one whatever um, but you know in a pseudo spell slinger these are not bad especially if you're trying to build a deck on the relatively cheap. Um, harmonize, same deal as Ambition's cost, uh, basically. We're already very heavily into green, so the double green's not a problem. We are playing one card in exchange for three cards. That is good. At four mana, it's even better at three mana. Painful Truths is... I, I, this card, uh, if you don't already consider it an EDH staple, I definitely think it's an EDH staple. Um, any deck that runs black and is in three or more colors is very good for three mana to draw three cards, which is usually what you'll be able to do with this. You know, if you can't do it in the early game, as long as you're not really hurting for cards, just wait until the mid or late game, cast this to draw three cards and lose three life. That is a huge uh, boon for, you know, having things to do in the game, having agency in the game, drawing three whole cards at a vintage power level. Yeah, very good in exchange for one card at three mana, which means, in theory, you could ramp into that on turn two or something. Uh, Pilfered Plans. The mill effect doesn't matter, but it's in two colors and draws us two cards, which makes it basically a divination that gets us one more Ramos counter. So, I mean, I don't know. Better than divination? Question mark? Who knows? Uh, Urban Evolution here. Again, one card that draws us three cards. Um, it's one more mana, so it's more of a, you know, tempo loss, but it's in two colors, so it gets us another, you know, extra Ramos counter double value there. And playing an extra land, very relevant, especially after drawing, uh, you know, the likelihood that you'll have a land in hand and be able to do that. Uh, it's just good. It's pseudo ramp also at the same time as drawing. Um, Soul's Majesty, so this is an effect that works very, very well in Ramos. Ramos can have a very high power toughness, very... You know, relatively quickly, like in the mid game, you could be looking at a 10, 10 plus Ramos, you know, Ramos is Ramos spends most of his time on the board being in two shot territory. Um, so, yeah, paying five mana to draw 10 cards is not bad. Not a bad ratio. Rish cars expertise. Uh, same exact thing, except even better. I mean, it costs one more mana, but uh, you get one more spell of your choice after the draw. Uh, very good. Read the Bones uh, is just kind of like a better divination. Again, use your life total as a resource. Uh, you know, you hit a critical mass. If you run too many Painful Truths, Read the Bones, City of Brass, Mana Confluence, you know, yeah, you, I guess you can, in too many Pain Lands, you can get to a point where Talismans, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there's a critical mass where you need to pump the brakes, but we're not there. I, think, I feel like we uh, are not even close to being there in this deck, so we're in good shape. Ramos is a good blocker too. Plea for power. Uh, yeah, again, four mana usually for three cards. Not bad. Uh, you know, it's, it, there are weird circumstances where, like, early in the game, you really don't want the extra turn more than you want the three cards. Uh, usually, if they give you the extra turn, that's just even better. Um, but yeah, sometimes an extra turn is just like a glorified explore. You know, draw an extra card, play an extra land. But, uh, yeah, so th those are the uh, draw effects, an average amount, I'd say, but some of them can be uh, pretty darn potent. Here we have the control suite. Uh, first of all, a bunch of instants. Abzan Charm already spoke about this at length. Very good. I like this a lot. Exiling a creature, always relevant. Worst case, instant speed divination that you just have to lose two life for. Uh, and again, the last mode, I uh, don't love ritual effects in Commander, but uh, it could still be very good if you have a way to immediately... Uh, draw a bunch of cards. It's just that the ritual effect itself is card disadvantage. Um, Anguished on making in two colors, gets two counters, exiles any problem non-land permanent. Very, very, very good. Arcane Denial. Yeah, I mean, it's a counter spell for two mana and only one of them is color specific. 
and in a multiplayer format, we don't care as much about one opponent drawing cards uh, because the amount of card disadvantage that is for you vis-a-vis the way you'd have to think about this in a one-on-one format is really kind of divided by the total number of opponents that you have. Uh, So one opponent drawing two cards, I mean, if they're the opponent that is the biggest problem for you, then maybe that equation is a little different. But if you're just kind of putting a stick in the spokes of someone who could be a threat but maybe isn't going to be the arch enemy, uh, or your your biggest threat, uh, yeah, don't hate them drawing two cards. Not to mention you get to draw one card. You know, it's a counterspell that replaces itself. That's really probably all that I had to say about this. (laughs) But Bant Charm, anyway, uh, was really good before they changed the tuck rule, but... Uh, <laughs> is also good post. Um, it deals with any indestructible creature by putting it on the bottom of the library. Um, it also uh, can deal with uh, you know a, a problem creature in a deck that might have a graveyard-based strategy. Destroying an artifact is not irrelevant. And countering instant spells, uh, you know, there are many good instants. Uh, I, I like that last mode the most if I'm playing some sort of a combo deck, actually. Uh, because then I can use this to counter an opponent's counter to protect my combo. Obviously, we're not trying to protect a combo in this deck, but you could still use it to protect like a big X cast draw spell, right? Um, just save three of that mana instead of drawing 10 cards, draw seven, and then hold up a Bant charm to protect it. And that's the more conservative way to do it. Difference between seven cards and 10 cards, not that big. Both are pretty big swings in how the game is going. Beast Within, arguably the best removal spell in Commander, hits any permanent. Drawback is a 3-3 Beast, which isn't that great in a 40-life multiplayer format. The only spell that might be better is Chaos Warp, because it uh, can shuffle it into the library rather than just destroying it, which gets around indestructible. Um, The only drawback, obviously, is that they might get an Eldrazi or something. Uh, But, the flip side of that is they might also just reveal uh, something that's not a permanent, like an instant or sorcery, and then they've got nothing. They've got nothing for their trouble. And often it's just like a land, which, you know, is good for them. It's a little consolation prize. But probably, yeah, in that situation, the beast within is probably better. You'd probably rather give an opponent a 3-3 creature token than a land. But anyway, anyway, which one's better? I don't know. There's a comment section for that. Croesus's Charm. Uh, just all three modes are relevant. Hits any permanent with bounce or any non-black creature. Artifacts can be good. Blah de blah. Pongify only costs one mana to destroy a creature. Normally, the most the most common threat you have to deal with is going to be a creature. In most meta games, I'd say. Uh, and so Pongify at one mana. Hard to argue with the price. Also, the uh, yeah same thing with Path to Exile. The ratio here: one mana for one counter. That's the same thing as like a a Bant Charm or an Abzan Charm. Like that's the same amount of mana per counter on Ramos. You know, you're still getting to the gush with the same efficiency. Uh, Path to Exile, just really good. Oblation, I like Oblation. People don't seem to run it as much as I think they should. Again, an opponent drawing two cards in a multiplayer format isn't as bad for you as in a one-on-one format. I guess unless that opponent is also... Uh, the, the one most capable of beating you. You know, if it's the opponent you're most scared of, then maybe you do have to kind of look at it as a little bit of a one-on-one with a couple other players in there as like a plane chase element, you know. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I I like Ablation. I It hits any permanent, any non-land permanent, and that's how you break up scary things by having flexible answers. Naya Charm, um, I like it because it returns a card from your graveyard to your hand at instant speed. That's, I mean, sometimes three damage to a creature is lethal, um, but it's mainly about that middle mode there and putting counters on Ramos. Mortify, uh, two colors to deal with a creature or an enchantment. This is very good. Grixis Charm hits any permanent or kills, you know, a healthy handful of creatures. A lot of problem creatures have four toughness and can kill them. And then, yeah, the last mode is probably never going to be used in this deck. Cyclonic Rift. Have you heard of this card? You should try this card. It's pretty decent. Psychic Strike counters a spell and puts two counters on Ramos. The mill effect, not that relevant. Putrefy, artifact or creature. 
instant speed, two colors, two counters on Ramos. Rapid hybridization, same thing as Pongify. Sultai Charm, uh, spoke about this at the beginning. Worst case, it's a slightly better cycle that puts three counters on Ramos. And best case, you know, you're destroying either a one color creature or an artifact or an enchantment that's causing you some, causing you some grief. At instant speed, Swords, really good. Terminate, two different colors, two counters on Ramos. Utter end, two colors. It's at four mana, so it's a little bit um, slower than every other instant I'm running, save for a overloaded Cyclonic Rift. Uh, but still, hits any non-land permanent. It exiles it uh, very, very, very strong um, in a deck that disproportionately appreciates multicolored spells. Um, that's it for my instants, 21 of them, then just one sorcery. One sorcery that's a control effect, I should say. Decree of Pain. Oh, ah, this card, I just picked up like four copies of it because I love it. Oh man, I feel like any deck that runs black in a creature meta, I don't, even if you're not in a creature meta, they're still playing creatures. I don't even know what a creature meta is. What am I saying? It just draws you cards. It wipes the board. It's a reset button that like refills your hand. Like this is a game winning play. Like, this is, ah, ah, yeah, and it, it cycles. Even You can cycle it if you need to. I don't think I've ever cycled a Decree of Pain. I think it's always worth, like, like if this is in your hand, this becomes your game plan. And, man, oh, it's good. I have it in control, but I could also put it in card draw. I guess it's not guaranteed card draw. Maybe there's only one creature on the board. It just, like, needs to be dealt with. But even then, it's replacing itself. You know how much I love cards replacing themselves. This does it and wipes the board. And, like, it doesn't just replace itself. It Ah, man. Ah. Oh, I'm going to say the same things over and over about this card just to ram it through your head that you should pick it up. Oh, it's so good. This card's really good. It's a lot of mana. It is a lot of mana. But, like, it's really good. Here we have just a pile of miscellaneous clothes and value. Uh, the clothes are right at the top. Just ways to keep Ramos safe. Standard issue, you know, lightning, greaves, swift foot boots. If you've played Commander for any amount of time, you know these cards. I don't include them in every deck. Not every deck cares as much as other decks about protecting the Commander. Sometimes your Commander doesn't cost very much mana. You can recast them relatively easily. Sometimes your Commander doesn't hate, like, hanging out in the graveyard. Like, I mean, I guess usually it's just that you don't care about needing to recast it. Or sometimes you're just sitting back on your Commander for a really long time, and you care about some enter-the-battlefield effect that they do or, or something, and it doesn't really matter if they are then dealt with. They don't need to stick around. Like, they're, these are not auto-includes in every single deck. They're not Soul Ring, but, you know, uh, many decks, obviously. They're very... It's very good to protect your most important creature. Um, Baleful Strix is just miscellaneous value. I don't like calling cards that simply replace themselves, quote, draw. I don't feel like that's quite correct. This is just a you know little cantrippy bird that also highly disincentivizes attacking uh, us, which you know is maybe better than a removal spell. Yeah, I would call Baleful Strix a removal spell before I called it card draw, actually, uh, because it's just such a strong deterrent to attacking. Um, and yeah, it puts two counters on Ramos. Uh, so miscellaneous value, it belongs here. Um, shielding Plax. Th ah, this is another uh, article of clothing for Ramos. It replaces itself. It is two colors. Adds two counters to Ramos uh, and gives it hex proof, right? Target of spells or abilities your opponent's control. Yes, I believe that is hex proof. And finally, Limduel's Vault. This card is weird. It takes... You might just want to pause right now and read it. Have you done that yet? You, you pause it, really, right now. Okay, we're good. We're good now. Anyone who was going to pause it already did. Limduel's Vault. Uh, yeah, you... you. It, 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 it's a pseudo-tutor. It's like if you're willing to spend... Five, six, seven life. Basically, it's a vampiric tutor uh, that just does that also. Uh, so that's not so bad. And you know, it's a vampiric tutor that goes a little deeper than that too. Like combined with a not scry five, but like rearrange, rearrange the top five of your library. It's just it's good. And and the fact that Ramos likes multicolored spells, you know, puts it over the edge. And finally, we have some payoff spells here. First up. Magister Sphinx. This card is brutal in Ramos. Oh man. 
I have a Ramos deck in paper. I don't, ha- as the series continues, I don't own all of these decks in paper, and I don't actually own this exact Ramos build in paper either. My paper build's a little different. But uh, yeah, Magister Sphinx, I have knocked out so many opponents by just like, Boom, surprise, Magister Sphinx. Oops, Ramos' power is over 10 because this adds three counters. Oops, you have no flyers, and ah, you're out of the game. Ah, so sad. Ah, it's it's pretty satisfying. Uh, sometimes it can lead to some... You have to be be nice about it. You know, you just play the... You know, it's, it, it's just a game, but, uh, like, it's pretty fun. Pretty fun to do that. Progenitus. <laughs> I talked about this in the signature cards. Like, yeah, if you have one... If you've got it, rock it, you know. Drop a progenitus and it'll it will help you close out the game. It it's swinging in one direction and Ramos swinging in another direct in another direction. Hopefully Ramos is dealing like lethal commander damage and then progenitus is getting your other opponent down to like eight life. Like yeah, you, you can get to a very um, end game board state quickly if this has been in play for a couple of turns, especially Coupled with Rafik of the Many, uh, with Progenitus, Rafik is very good. The, the first time I really played Rafik was not as a Rafik deck, but actually in a Progenitus deck I put together. I think I did a deck tech on that a few years ago. Um, but Rafik also works very, very well with Ramos, um, granting double strike and plus one, plus one. Often Ramos is attacking alone. Usually Ramos is attacking alone. Uh, that brings Ramos into one-shot territory very quickly. I mean, even if Ramos is just a 4-4, four, four, you drop Rafik, add three counters, seven, seven. You're only one three-color charm away from Ramos being one-shot territory. And you could even do that at instant speed before the opponent realizes it's going to be a lethal swing. Uh, Rafik plus Ramos is brutal. Brutal, brutal, brutal. Um, Hadana's Climb. This is the one that transforms into the land that uh, doubles a creature's power and gives it flying. Um, again, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of a payoff effect. Uh, you know, I might also consider this a ramp effect because this transforms into a land basically immediately. Uh, but yeah, anything that can double Ramos's power can knock out an opponent in one shot very easily. Um, Conflux, I was talking about this at the beginning of the video. Just very strong, very, very strong in a Ramos build. Uh, you don't want too many payoff spells. As you can see, I'm running six, maybe five, if you count Hadana's as a ramp. Uh, but, uh, yeah, one of them should be Conflux. And Time Stretch, just, I mean, it costs ten mana. Ramos makes ten mana. It's too too good to pass up. This plus two turns means, uh, you know, if you don't win the game technically over those two turns, you should, like, be able to knock out problem opponent one and problem opponent two leaving your weakest opponent after you've just taken three turns in a row uh with a big big ramos like you should be able to close it out from there uh time stretch strong strong stuff let's see this deck goldfish all right we're gonna goldfish a few turns here with ramos see how it goes there's our opening hand i like it any opening hand with multiple ramp effects. This is the time of the game that uh, we want to ramp. Looks like, uh, yeah, we've got a game plan. Ramp, ramp into an early Ramos. Uh, anguished on making for a little control. Add some counters. We'll draw into some other things and hopefully gush into a stroke of genius. Always good to have a hand with a plan. Turn one, we will draw Sandstep Citadel. Um, let's see. Probably want to play the Seaside Citadel by the seashore first. Untap turn two, draw a Putrefy, another multicolor control effect. Uh, we will drop the Yavamaya Coast and take a point of damage. Boop, 39 uh, to cast. Let's go with a Far Seek because next turn, if we play the Fertile Ground on a potentially untapped land, I mean, might not be able to. Well, no, we would be able to get there because of this Far Seek. Um, it nets us one extra mana that turn. Uh, which is good in case we draw into something. Uh, so let's see, what do we want to grab with the far seek here? Uh, probably a mountain would make the most sense. Let's go with a snow-covered mountain tap. There we go, far seek into turn three. Untap, draw. Oh, birds of paradise would have been better on turn one, but we'll take it on turn three. Uh, let's see here. So if we do a fertile ground onto the snow-covered mountain, then two mana, one equals um, birds of paradise. Just thinking out loud here. Let's yeah, do one, two. We'll get the green off the citadel. Uh, we will cast a fertile ground. 
we will attach it to our snow-covered mountain, and then for one, two, we will drop a bop, um, and we'll play a land for turn. Arcane Sanctum, and go ahead and do it like that. Uh, setting us up for a very strong turn four here. Uh, draw, main, turn to another ramp effect. Uh, and that leaves us with one, two, three, four, five, six mana on turn four. Could drop a turn four Ramos, depends on the pod that we're in, um, if we think people might have answers. Ramos tends to be a little fragile, being an artifact and a creature at the same time, so um, I prefer not to cast Ramos until uh, we can at least back Ramos up with the illusion of a counter spell, a little bit of mana floating, or just, just some sort of interaction, right? Um, so. I think the more conservative line of play here is probably, um, let's do one, two, three like so. Cast a Weirding Wood. We will attach it to our Yapamaya Coast. I love to ramp, 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 especially in the early game if, uh, oh, what am I doing? We want to make a clue. There we go. Um, yeah. Ramping is almost always a better play than going for a big play instead of ramping, right? Almost always better, especially this early in the game, to hold off on our big splashy effects in favor of just building resources, building resources, building resources. Because here, I mean, it's just more conservative. We have um, four mana up. We would be able to cast our Anguished Unmaking or our Putrefy, and, um, you know, if we don't need to, which we likely won't on turn four, um, we'll be able to pop this clue. I'll go ahead and just do that to draw an extra card in Command Tower. Sight for eyes that are sick of lands entering. Tap. Let's move to turn five. Uh, draw. Cultivate. Rampity, 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 ramp. Uh, count our mana. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, potentially eight this turn. Um, so it is a question of do we want to play the Citadel or the Command Tower? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, potentially eight mana. Six, seven, eight, that's only two mana. So I think um, we do want to play the Citadel, get that out of the way. And then for one, two, three, I suppose. Let's cultivate. Let's really, really make sure that uh, we will have the mana to follow up Ramos with some effects. Um, I don't know, let's go with an island and uh, it doesn't, doesn't really matter a ton. Um, a planes. Planes sounds good. Reveal a planes, put it in our hand, shuffle our library. Um, we have four mana left. Let's say we do wind up. It is kind of awkward. We would have to tap four mana to make the specific colors we need for, well, let's say a putrefy. You know, let's destroy an artifact or a creature. Can't be regenerated. Someone try to do something big turn five, not beyond the realm of possibility. We will draw for turn six. Um, Go ahead and play that command tower. Organize my lands here just for a second. boop a doop Seems like time for Ramos. One, two, three, four, five, six. Drop Ramos. Uh, and let's say when it's not our turn, um, we do wind up one, two, three, casting an anguished on making. Doop, doop, doop. Dealing with some sort of threat, putting two counters on Ramos. Move to turn seven. Untap. Draw. Might have played ourselves here a little bit. Uh, don't have more than just a stroke of genius. Uh, well, you know, I, I take that back. Uh, we can just hard cast the stroke of genius without the gush from Ramos. And that'll be plenty good. So we'd pass turn and then wait until the end step before ours to cast a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let's pour nine man into the Stroke of Genius. Let's let's bluff a counter spell here. All right, let's let's try to convince people that they don't need to counter us drawing six cards. Um, <laughs> add one counter to Ramos, and then draw one, two, three, four, five, six. Put this in our graveyard. Now we're getting somewhere. Turn eight. Been playing pretty conservatively here. Um, holding up removal spells, interacting when we need to. Oh, there's Progenitus. Main phase. We will play a... I'm going to move these lands up here, do a little bit of board management. Um, just so that everything is as clear as possible. Play a brush land, little pain land there. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 
mana available to us. Uh, if we can cast two spells, then Ramos can gush. And, um, you know, a, a brutal line of play here would be a Magister Sphinx. Because then Ramos becomes, what's that, a 9-9? Nine, nine? Three, four, five, six, no, four, five, six, seven, eight, no, eight, nine, ten, yeah. Ramos is currently a seven, seven, so Magister Sphinx would make Ramos a ten, ten while dropping someone's life total to ten. Uh, seems, <laughs> seems very strong. Turn eight, one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven. We will cast the Magister Sphinx. We will set the counters on Ramos to six, uh, making the power toughness a ten, ten. Um, Magister, Sphinx will, Magister Sphinx will come into play. An opponent's life total will become 10. Let's say they also have a blocker. So for 1, 2, 3, uh, we cast a Chaos Warp. Ramos goes up to 7 and becomes an 11, 11. Uh, Chaos Warp their thing. And then move to combat. Attack with Ramos to knock out an opponent on turn 8. You know, not that early to be knocked out, but, you know, a little bit early. And we're in pretty good board position from here. Uh, second main phase, we can drop Ramos counters to 2 in order to make 10 mana to drop a Progenitus. And we're holding up 2 mana for a single target Psych Rift if we need it. You know, maybe we'll get blown out here. This would be a good time for an opponent to cast a board wipe. But uh, anyway, you, you get the picture. You can see what Ramos is capable of. Uh, a little bit of a... I mean, I, I drew a lot of ramp, I guess, in the opening hand. But we still waited to cast Ramos until we had some follow-up. And might have flown a little close to the sun, spending some removal spells before uh, was able to get value on Ramos. But still, pretty good position for turn 8 here. Um, yeah, holding on to a Psych Rift if we can overload that in the next few turns. Uh, don't care so much about the ramp effects. We just have ramp and lands in our hand, but, um, you know, ho hopefully our board state as it is is enough to um, create an advantage that opponents can't overcome. So, anyway, that is EDH Rec Tech. Hope you enjoyed yourself. Watch. Hope you learned something. I learned something. Uh, check out all the links in the description. Remember to subscribe. Uh, call your mother tonight and tell her uh, that you love her. And, uh, yeah, until next time, I'm Dan Brown. And that's how we end these videos.